Good evening and welcome to the Arlington Public Schools regular board meeting. I'm Mary Levesque and I want to say thank you all for joining us. We are going to um, call the meeting to order and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And next we'll have our land acknowledgement by Dr. Sweeting. Thank you. We honor the first peoples of these lands by acknowledging that the area in which we gather is within the traditional territory of the Stillaguamish tribe of Indians. The Stillaguamish people have inhabited these lands and waters since time immemorial, and their ancestors have remained in this territory to this day. The Stillaguamish people have continued to practice the traditional ways of their ancestors of fishing, hunting, and gathering. The Stillaguamish tribe has had these lands and cultural traditions passed on to them by their ancestors who believed that everything has a spirit and that they are the caretakers of these lands and waters. Thank you. Next, we'll have our roll call attendance. Madam Clerk. Director Ray. He is absent and excused. Director Kelly. Here. Director Kingman. Here. President Levesque. Here. Director Knapp. Here. Student Advisor Schroeder. Here. Superintendent Sweeting. Here. Thank you. Next up on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I make a motion we approve the agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. Can we please have a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you. The agenda is now adopted. Next up, we'll have our presentation, um, our introduction of our new student advisors, and this will be presented by Dr. Sweeting. I'm going to go up to the front. So we believe that it's so important to listen to our students and their voice is critical. And it's, it's that their voice will help us to make better decisions, to see perspectives uh, from a different view, from the most important view, because we exist for the students and what we provide in our mission is about the students. So tonight I get to share um, nine individual students that are joining us in a particular way to give us their voice and their perspectives. The first one is the new board advisor. Um, her name is Mariska Laban. She is gonna, Maddie's reti uh, retiring. Maddie, yeah, she's retiring from K-12. She's graduating on Thursday and she's been with us for two years and we honored her at the last board meeting and we will miss Maddie but we went through an inter interview process, uh, students applied, and Mariska is going to join us starting in August. So she'll be with us then. Next, we have an important committee that is a board commission committee, and we're gonna hear a report about that group tonight, Advisory Council for Education, or ACE for short. And we have students that are on that, and there's four of them, and I think they're all here. So I'm gonna ask them to stand. So first we have Alyssa Acosta and just stay standing, Alyssa. And then Rosa Barkley, Grant Kramer in the back and Ava Wolf. She's here. Not, not yet. Okay, so I would like, I know, Grant, can you come up here too? Cause I want you guys to just say one reason why you wanted to be on the ACE committee. Who wants to go first? Grant, will you lead the way? Uh, sure. Uh, I was excited to get to know my community more and better help the education of Arlington Public Schools. 
I also wanted to help the education because I care about the students and stuff, and I think I have a valuable opinion. I wanted to share some of my classmates' views on things that are happening in the school, so I thought that it would be good if I could share some of those opinions that are out there. Thank you. And the commitment of these young people is two years. Two years. Uh, they're sophomores now. They'll be juniors and seniors in the next two years, so they will join us in those and grapple in lots of deep conversations. So thank you. Thank you for joining us in this. You can sit down now. <laughs> so, uh, the next uh, group is th there's uh, four individuals that were that applied and were interviewed and they were selected to be student advisors to our district community equity team. And this is uh, this this equity team really was started last year as a result of our equity policy and our equity plan. And this, it's really deep conversations and we need to have the student voice on that uh, committee. So I think we've got some of those individuals with us tonight. And so on the committee, and this is a commitment of two years as well. So juniors now, soft, uh, uh, sophomores now, junior and senior, your commitment. And uh, it's both, both committees meet once a month and more if needed, but we'll make sure you get all your homework. That's a priority. <laughs> That's why you won't work you too hard. Um, so uh, we have uh, first uh, Kathleen Vesperia. Okay. And then Jocelyn is not here, I don't think, but, and you know, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but Connie also, or it's close. And then we have Raven Kaludis, Kaludis, I got it. And then we have Sarah Sable. So I'm gonna ask you why and how you might serve on this committee. So who would like to go first? Okay, thanks, Kathleen. I wanted to be on the district and community equity team so that I could share with my community what I thought was going on in our classrooms and to share um, how I could be more involved in our community. I wanted to give back to my community and help share people's voices. Um, I just wanted to get a little bit more involved in my community. Yeah, please give them a hand for their commitment. Thank you. You can go if you'd like, because Mr. Sable says. <laughs> so, thank you for coming tonight to be introduced. Thank you so much. Thank you and welcome aboard to all of our student advisors. Our work is much richer with student voices. Thank you. Next up, we'll have our another presentation, a recognition. We're gonna be honoring our 2021, 20, 22 retirees this year. Um, We'll introduce Eric DeYoung, our Executive Director of Human Resources, and he can explain all the fun we just had. Yes, good evening. Nice to see you again. Um, we just had honored 34 retirees over at President's Elementary, and they're still cleaning up, actually. And uh, it was a, a really fun event to see all of our retirees. And I think we're going to start a slideshow. Brenda's going to start that. I want to also thank Brenda and Debbie who helped us with the party planning over there and set up and everything. It was really tremendous. So thank you. And here's our retirees, 34, which is a really a record graduating class uh, as far as retirees go for Arlington School District. I don't remember a year where we've had this many retire in one year. So we've, we have everybody from tr uh, bus drivers to teachers to paraeducators, secretaries, all across our district. I think every building this year had a retiree, at least one. Uh, so it was a really, um, it's gonna be a big impact to our to our district to lose all of that experience. and. Um, excellent teachers and, and staff that we've had. So we're working hard to, to fill those spots, that's for sure. So we're gonna show the slideshow here and um, it'll go through and you'll see all the faces and, and pictures of the, of the retirees.
you're touching. Thank you. And thank you to all of our staff members who put in so many hours and, and years and touched so many lives of so many students. Um, your work is appreciated and we are very grateful and we're not gonna cry tonight. Um, next up on our agenda is our approval of our regular meeting minutes from May 23rd. Make a motion we approve the regular meeting minutes from May 23rd. I second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the regular meeting minutes from May 23rd, 2022. Madam Clerk. Director Kelly. Aye. Director Kingman. Aye. President Levesque. Aye. Director Knapp. Aye. The minutes are now approved. Next up, the part of our agenda um, that we would reserve for our public comments. We don't have anybody signed up. And so we are going to skip ahead next to our consent agenda which consists of our personnel report, our payroll report, warrants, adjusted warrants, an overnight trip for the ROTC leadership, uh, out of district overnight travel for the school board um, to Spokane, the superintendent's contract, a uh, resolution 2207 authorization to invest funds. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I make a motion we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, can we please take a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda is now approved. Before we move on to our next item of business, um, I'm going to allow Superintendent Sweeting to introduce some of the um, names mentioned in our personnel report. Thank you, President Levesque. So in the consent agenda, we have the board just approved uh, three new individuals to our team. And I believe two are here. I'm not sure I see the third, but I'd like to, inter I'd like to introduce Kyle Ax Axelson and stand up, Kyle. Kyle is, um, he's currently at Mariners High School in Edmonds and he's been there six years, but our Uncle Teal, Edmonds. Close, close. And uh, he's been there for six years in that role, but been in education for 17 years. We're just very happy that you're here. Would you like to say a few words, Kyle? Uh, no, I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I'm excited to get started. We're glad. Thank you, Kyle. And then, welcome. And then next, I believe we have Denise Eitler here. She's, come on up, Denise. Denise is a really close neighbor to us. She is in Stanwood. She has been in Stanwood for 20 years. And um, in the last four years, she's been doing her administrative internship. And uh, we're glad you're here, Denise. <laughs> Good. I hope that wasn't too hard because we know about the Stilly Cup. So I hope that wasn't too hard to say. Welcome. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Oh, Pam is on Zoom. Okay. Well, Pam. Oh, I see you, Pam. Pam Kluzman, um, welcome. She just was approved as the new assistant principal at Pioneer. And uh, Pam is, uh, she's current, well, she's taught at many different grades. I think the only one maybe is uh, first grade, but she's done second grade, third grade, a three, four split and fifth grade. And uh, she um, has been this last year, besides doing her administrative internship she's been a teacher on special assignment to support um, behavior needs and such so pam would you like to say a few words thank you i'm excited to be here <laughs> and a part of arlington thank you pam and pam is coming to us let's see pam's in the kitsap school district right now so if you know where she's coming from welcome pam thank, thank you, you. Um, one more person, not a new person that we've hired, but a person we're saying goodbye to, which uh, five years ago, we hired this individual to lead our comprehensive high school, Arlington High School. And uh, Dwayne Fish has been a uh, just a pivotal leader in our district during the last five years, where he has brought uh, strength and strong character 
to that campus. The culture is evolving and changing because of his leadership. And I'm, I mean, I'm excited he's going on a new adventure in Texas, but um, we will miss you, Dwayne, so much. And I just wanna thank you publicly for your leadership. And I just wish it was here longer, but uh, we wish you well in Texas. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting, for the great um, announcement and um, acknowledgement of our new leadership and, and appreciation for our, our departing leaders. Um, every time I think Dwayne Fish, I'm always going to think character strong. It's part of your name now. Um, next up on our new business portion of our meeting, we'll have our academic and student well-being plan update by Dr. Sweeting. Okay, I need my running shoes on tonight. This I'm going to share my screen once I can finish this first. Own a friend. Debbie is our lifeline. This is what happens when Mark and his heart retired. All right, thank you. It was a team effort, but you know we're good at that. We're very good at team effort here in Arlington. So um, tonight for the academic and student well-being uh, report, I wanted to do a wrap up. You know, this is the last uh, board meeting before the last day of school. So I just wanted to to kind of take a view of this last year, the efforts that we've been doing. So the first. This is a year in review, so 21, 22. So don't, you know, I didn't intend for you to read all the numbers on this. I just want you to look at the patterns. So what you see here is the top three rows are, are three months from the beginning of the year. So like, I think it was October, November, December. Look at the COVID uh, cases. It's like a roller coaster. You know, in dealing with that when we open school this fall, five days back in person. Then the bottom row is that first one is January. See the big spike? And we had a really hard time in January covering classes. And it was, you know, it was, and then that started to drop. And then it dropped some more. And then the next slide is now. So the good news is that roller coaster going back and forth and back and forth has soothed out you know, and smoothed out. So I hope that stays that way. The next couple of slides, you can't read this either, but the, if you, uh, it shows the sequence of the infections within our own district. And you can see this is the same fall and then after fall. And so I uh, pay attention to the top numbers. So you can look at the very last on the right. There's very few, like the last two is very few where there's lots of high numbers at, in the fall and then also in January. Here are the numbers now. We have eight, as of last Friday, eight positives in the district. And the next page is even better. So last Friday, 
that what that means is anything under five, we can't, we don't report. So that means that there was not one school last Friday that had more than five positives. So I just, in wrapping up where we've been and, and that journey is that we've been on a roller coaster, but it, it has leveled out in a good place. So we're moving forward. And, you know, part of, you know, the challenge that we had the last two years with COVID is there were some academic and social and emotional needs that we've had to really figure out how we're going to tend to, and we're going to still have to figure out how to tend to. I'm just going to remind everyone that we've, we have these, these uh, strategies or interventions we made happen this year to tend to the student well being, social emotional uh, needs in the district. The student support advocates at secondary schools have been wonderful. They really help high risk uh, needs of high risk. And so they're individuals that have mental health um, degrees, background. So they're really uh, important to us to help with those um, heavy emotional behavioral needs. Uh, the social emotional curriculum we approved and implemented and people, the purposeful people is a connect, it's the same as character strong. So it's awesome. We're starting, not waiting till high school for learning that character strong. Uh, we added additional counseling at, at the middle school level. We added campus monitors at, at, uh, at the middle school level and at the high school level. So those were important to support the well being of our students. Uh, we did increase funding at Weston for after school clubs to help draw that, uh, the attendance there. And we increased the health services support at each school. Every school it, it received um, uh, health assistance time, eight, I think it was almost, I think, all day, all day, eight hours or 6.5 hours. Um, I think there were eight of them. Next, academic support. We had Eagle Study, uh, which is on our Fridays, early dismissal, where students could stay and get support that they needed um, in areas that they uh, are struggling or they just want some extra help and extra time to work on things. We impl we're implementing uh, inclusionary practices, which we're learning a lot how to do that. Uh, we're uh, going through a lot of professional learning, the adults in the system to how to do that. And really it involves that every need that every student has, each student is taken care of, that everyone is included so that they can engage in high levels of instruction. Then we have multi-tier systems of support, not just for academics, but also for behavior and emotional, social emotional. Universal design for learning is, uh, it's, it's a, a thinking, a way of approaching where you're gonna remove barriers and increase access. It's like when you're doing universal design for buildings, then you're thinking about, okay, if I put a ramp here then everybody can access it, there's nobody that's gonna be left behind where well, we don't want anybody to be left behind in our instruction. So it's universal design for instruction and learning. And we increase paraeducator support at the elementary school significantly. And we increase special education staffing and we're doing, uh, there's some summer uh, recovery tutoring that's gonna happen this summer. And so, some of these things, if not all of these things, will continue next year because we're not, we, you know, we, we're still in this, uh, we have the needs, we have the academic and the social emotional needs. Uh, next, summer school, these are the opportunities, so summer uh, learning opportunities, we have the credit retrieval and advancement, the literacy camp for elementary extended school year for those needs with the students that have highest needs that uh, they need to come in the summer for their specific areas. We have a STEM camp, science, technology, engineering, and math camp for our elementary English language learners, uh, eighth grade to ninth grade transition opportunity, and summer recovery services, which are the tutoring services that I mentioned. And on the next slide, the cool bus. So... <laughs> I mean, there's a former name for this, but I'm not even go back to the former name because I like the new name of the cool bus. And the cool bus is going around and it's gonna support math and reading needs across the district. And there's a schedule and um, thank you, Carl Olson for the cool bus that's gonna go around and, and help our students even learn. And they're gonna feel cool while they're learning. Um, and then of course, 
you know, we've, the, the students have been working hard, the staff have been working hard, and we have graduations this week. And we're going to go to those graduations and we're going to celebrate that the mission that we say that we're preparing and educating our students and inspiring them to graduate, that happens this week. So it's awesome. And so you can see the dates there of when the graduations will take place this week. That's it. Kind of a wrap up of the year. And really it's a wrap up of the year, but see it never wraps up because we're gonna continue this work. It's ongoing, ongoing. So any questions? I'm just really curious about what these after school clubs are at Weston. Do you know? Let's see, um, Eric, well, Andy is not here, but they, I, and Eric would know because Eric's supervisor, but I know that one, oh, Eric, <laughs> Mr. DeYoung, my lifeline over there. So Eric, can you, some of the clubs that we, we and maybe Gina can remember too, that we gave funding to, to oh, you're coming to the podium and everything. So the question is this, the after school clubs at Weston that we funded, we gave some, I think $5,000. So can you tell us a couple of the clubs? Well, there are some gaming clubs, um, some card games. I think it's mainly card games actually. And so in-person type stuff, there may be some video game stuff as well that they do. Uh, those were, those are two of them. There may be another one that I'm forgetting, but I know those two. I think you're right. Thank you. Thank you. And part of that too is the, Thank you, Eric, you did a nice job. Um, so part of that was just trying to find ways to engage students to want to come to school, keep them in school, and, and really the clubs help with that. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Dr. Sweeting, for that very detailed and final wrap-up of, of the COVID years. Hopefully this is and the next item on our new business, we're very excited to welcome our Advisory Council for Education Annual Report. And this will be presented by Dr. Sweeting and a few distinguished guests. So we'd like to welcome Britt Kleinman to come on up. And I think Erica Coghill is on Zoom. And I thought I saw Judy Faye come in. There she is. Judy, come on down. <laughs> Because we have fun here. Good evening, Board of Directors. I'm Brett Feynman. I am the current chair of the Advisory Council for Education uh, this year and next year. Um, and then Erica Coghill is our uh, vice chair. She is on, joining us on Zoom. I don't know if we were able to bring her in yet. OK. Oh. Hi, <laughs> here she is. I'm here. And then uh, we also have Judy Faye here, who is uh, one of our advisory members. Are you getting your presentation up, Dr. Sweeting? Yes, why don't you tell us how long you've been in the AIDS committee? Yeah. I don't remember. I believe this, I'm just wrapping up my fourth year on ACE. So this is my first year as chair though. And you have a grade schooler I, and do, a, I just have a middle schooler in in public schools right now yes my oldest is at Haller she's finishing up sixth grade and then one more year and then I'll have a little one back at Pioneer good yes. and he's so cute thank you I'm kind of partial There we go. Okay, perfect. I'm sorry. Usually <laughs> that little green button's right down there, but Brittany, thank you. Did a nice job. Um, I wanted to share well, for just a moment that everything that the ACE committee does is aligned to our strategic plan. It guides our work, the four goals that are in the strategic plan, student learning and achievement, increasing that, uh, ensuring that we have a safe and caring environment and being a good steward of our resources and family uh, parent involvement. And so uh, the work that we do is, is in support of the strategic plan. And so I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay. Um, so the type of committee that we are ACE uh, falls under policy uh, 4110 and procedure 4110P. 
Uh, we do have a charter that over, goes over our purpose, um, what our membership needs to be like and who from the school district joins our membership, um, and then the duration and our leadership. For us, we, um, we are a standing committee that's commissioned by the school board. So our job is to advise you guys and do research projects um, that either we come up with or you come up with for things that uh, you're interested in learning more about but need some extra support for. Um, and then the cool thing about our group is that we are made up of all different types of people. We've got staff, we have parents, community members, students, as you'll see as we get going here. Um, we do meet monthly throughout the school year, so September through June. We do take July and August off, though. So one thing that um, is really cool about our group is that we may get a point to try to have every building in the district represented by at least one person. Uh, we have decided that our goal now is to have two people representing every building if possible. Uh, we want to make sure that we're hearing voices of from all different areas of the district. Um, so we have Carrie Pendray, who represents Arlington High School. We still need one more representative. Uh, Jess Robinette for Weston and looking for another. Um, Haller is myself and Stacy Jacobs. For post middle school, we have Sarah Blake and are looking for one more person. For SVLC, we are looking for two more represent representatives. Perfect. For elementary school, we have Ryan Johnson for Eagle Creek and could use one more. We currently have nobody um, representing Pioneer, Kent Prairie, or Presidents. So if you know of anybody, send them my way, please. Um, and then each of you get to pick a representative as well. Um, again, now we are trying to up that to two. So for District 1, we have Erica Bress and need another. For District 2, we have Lauren Hunter. Uh, District 3 is uh, Judy Fay. District 4 is Kimberly Nino. And District 5 is Erica Gago. Uh, we also have student representatives. Tonight you met some of our new representatives that will be joining us next year. Uh, we do have three graduating seniors, uh, Montan Copenhaver, uh, Odie Ingalls, and Sophie Willis that have been with us the last uh, three years. And then, or I'm sorry, the last two years, Madison Griffith, um, Morgan Hadley, and then two, uh, four new students are coming on board. Uh, per, for me, working with those students is actually my favorite part of being on this um, committee because getting to hear the voices directly from the students and what they find important or their opinions on a lot of the um, topics we research, um, I personally think is the, those are the most important voices of the groups. And then we do have staff, staff representation as well. So we have Carrie Henderson Burke, Carrie Helgeson, Carrie Marsh, Ryan Barcy, um, Anne McKelvey. Uh, we are looking for a certified uh, AEA representative. We have Gary Sable, um, who serves as our board secretary, and then Dr. Sweeting. And then Mary Levesque and Erica Knapp from the school board obviously join us as well, which we appreciate. Um, so our committee is an ongoing committee. Members are appointed for two years. And then when we have vacancies, they're filled by appointment to fill out the balance of that year. Um, but we are always looking for new members and we're not gonna tell you no if you wanna join us. Uh, we do have a chairperson and a vice chairperson um, that's approved by a majority vote and we serve two years. So um, like I said, Erica Coghill and I are the chair and vice chair and we are just wrapping up our first year. So you'll get us for one more year. Um, and then it's, uh, I as the chairperson get to work closely with um, Dr. Sweeting and with Gary Sable um, to work on our agendas, our topics, um, any changes we need to make. Um, and then our committee can communicate with any of the three of us on any topics that they would like added, discussed again, et cetera. Um, uh, so the superintendent or uh, another uh, person, uh, such as the director of communication will help support the work of ACE. And then um, Gary also takes our meeting minutes, provides them to us uh, to be reviewed and approved for the next meeting. Um, our responsibilities include participating in our district strategic planning and providing recommendations to you guys. Uh, we also research on topics that the board would like um, additional information on or any topic that other ACE committees have brought up. Um, and then we work uh, with the district and the staff um, to help spread the information out to the community. We serve as that key communicator to members informing them of our district initiatives, 
Um, and then we help work with other committees and subcommittees as needed. So um, members of our group have helped with um, equity policies. Uh, you'll see um, in some of the stuff we've talked about this year is working on um, how to get our district to go more green and have less of a carbon footprint. Um, so we've, we've kind of helped with several of those different type of um, committees outside of ACE over the years. Um, and then we do presentations, board research, and other tasks. And then you get to see us once a year. All right, uh, Erica is going to take over and she's gonna go over um, what topics we covered this year in our meetings. Yeah, so even though we have moved our meetings to Zoom, we've still managed to cover quite a few topics throughout the year. Um, I'll just read the list off so you can see what we've been talking about. Uh, district and community equity efforts, academic and student well-being updates, um, other district updates um, as things are coming up throughout the year and particularly COVID has been <laughs> brought up a few times. Um, family and community survey results, capital projects, discipline updates and policy review, school and district improvement plans and efforts. And that's not all. We've got elementary secondary school emergency relief, um, which is the ESSR funds, categorical programs, assessment overview, child nutrition, how school funding works, and special education services. And college and career readiness, technology, robotics, a student attendance and community truancy board, and climate change and the need for reducing our carbon footprint and going greener. We've been very busy all year. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. <laughs> it's always impressive when you put the list together. For sure. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, as you can see, we each meeting, we don't tend to have a theme. Um, and sometimes that's a presenter going over specific data with us or a specific projects or that are going on in the district. Um, for this upcoming uh, year, we've got a few things that we are hoping to go over. Um, a revised master facilities plan review is, is one thing that's on our list. Uh, so Brian Lewis will be coming to meet with us and discuss that. Uh, we do have goals of um, continuing our work on um, how to continue our green effort and lower our carbon footprint. Um, so our hope would be to try to have a subcommittee for that uh, going forward. Um, we've talked about uh, revisiting our strategic plan and seeing what updates or changes need to be made and any other topics that you guys would like us to research or cover next year. All right. Um, the big thing is, is like I said, working with the students has been, it really is such a blessing and we learn so much from them um, and their voice really does matter. So we do want to say a big thank you to them um, and putting in that time. We have a couple seniors that have been with us for a few years graduating. Uh, so we want to say a special congratulations to Montan Copenhaver, uh, Odie Ingalls, and Sophie Willis. Um, it's sad to, to see them leave. We got to have dinner with Sophie and Montan last week and it was wonderful hearing about what their plans are going forward. And it's crazy how much, uh, how much these teens grow and change in the couple years that we get to work with them. And, um, but all the great ideas that come out of them are really, it's really a great thing to get to experience. But does anybody have any questions for us? such a marvelous job that I don't need to add much, but I just wanted to re reiterate that um, we so look forward to, we know that you all have goals and plans and um, you'll be working on those. Um, and we look forward to helping you in any way we can um, to support you. We have an amazing group of people, very diverse from cultural backgrounds and um, um, skill knowledge bases and their abilities. Um, are, will play well to helping you because that's part of what they do in their normal jobs anyway. So we look forward to hearing from you. Um, one of the people on our ACE committee has really helped guide us this year, Sarah Blake, and she's helped us. Um, she works in the environmental field and she spearheaded the 2019 Eagle Creek solar installation, um, which is amazing that um, she could work with Snohomish County PUD and make that happen for Arlington School District. So she's really been guiding us this year in terms of our carbon footprint as a school district and, and helping us realize ways that we can do it. And then we're also really looking um, at ways um, the schools can engage students in climate change awareness and action. 
So we're looking forward to that for next year and it'll be, um, yeah, it'll be exciting to do that. So we look forward to hearing from you. Um, our subcommittees have done well and we look forward to um, forming more. Thank you, Judy. Uh, one last thing I wanted to share with you guys that I think is really important is uh, we do have such a diverse group of people. Um, and one thing that's really great about that is that um, we also represent um, several other organizations and volunteer roles in the community. And I think that's a really important way to show some of the partnerships that the school district and the advisory council have. Uh, for example, some of our members are part of ADAC, which is Arlington Drug Awareness Coalition. Uh, we have members that are part of the Arlington Runners Club, Youth Dynamics. Uh, the City Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, we have partnerships with the city, the hospital districts. We have the equity team and many of our volunteers um, also volunteer in our school buildings on a regular basis. So I think that's important for you guys to hear as well. So if there's no other questions, that's all I have for you guys tonight. I have, I have one little question. Yeah. How are we advertising that we need additional um, community members to step up from these various um, places are we are we doing any kind of advertising recruiting mm -hmm. are we do we do we need to work on that how how would you what would you like us to do I definitely think that it's something we should probably all could work on is helping to uh, do some recruiting um, I think the biggest thing is going to be all of us talking to um, you know our friends who have kids in these schools especially the schools that we have needs in um, and then all of us working with Gary Sable to get some some communication out on that. I know on the school website it does show uh, what areas we who represents what stuff and where we need to fill in those gaps. Um, so hopefully this summer we can do a communication push and try to get some more representatives um, on board before September. Yeah, we did um, uh, on the our schools in the mid year. We put on the very back page a big ask, you know, and highlighted different committees that we wanted people. So more of that, maybe even a peach jar, mm -hmm. a flyer um, requesting, uh, because especially we're almost trying to double. And the reason why we want to double it is because not everybody comes and we just want to make sure we have representation from every, every director district and every school. So, and if they all come, that's even, that's even better. We've been meeting on Zoom and we did decide as a group to continue to meet on Zoom, except for the last time when we meet for a meal, <laughs> which I have to tell you that Montan and Sophie, when they came to have a meal with us at the last meeting, it was the first time they'd met with us in person for two years. They'd served for two years, but never been with us for in, in person. It was They had to come just to check us out, make sure that we were real. <laughs> Thank, Thank you guys so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Brett and Judy and Erica um, and all of the members of the ACE committee for all your, your work. I have enjoyed working with the ACE committee for a very long time. It's really fun um, to just get into the nitty gritty and learn as much as possible about all the things we've got going on in our district. Okay, next up on our agenda is the very fun Budget development briefing for 22-23 by our lovely Gina Seatonhorse. All right. Let me work on getting my screen shared. Here we go. So thank you. Yes, Gina Zutenhorst, Executive Director of Financial Services, and I'm here to give you a budget development update as we are preparing, working so hard to get to our numbers for what our 2022, 23, so next year's budget is going to be. Let's see if I can manipulate this screens very well. So with numbers, they can be kind of impersonal. So I always like to bring it back to what our purpose is and how we align with what our district's mission is. We are all about uh, vision aligned budgeting. Our primary mission, again, is to educate, prepare, and inspire students to graduate and seek their full potential as lifelong learners. Within that, it goes a little deeper. So we've got four goals, but goal three, is where the financial and the budget aligns most closely with, and that is the 
resource stewardship. That's about securing quality resources, people, time, money, and property, and aligning those resources to support equitable learning and achievement for students by making decisions using an equity lens and data. But I really like to say that that goal really exists to support all the other goals that we have as a district. Uh, we have some subsets within that goal, allocating resources to maximize student learning, maintain and improve and replace buildings and equipment, invest community resources prudently. And going deeper, our board has done some work around vision aligned budgeting and has incorporated some detailed values into our board policy and procedure around budget decisions. So this is a comprehensive list smaller print because I've got it all on one slide, but um, I have been highlighting these are unique times. And I have been highlighting one of the bullets there that talks about fund balance and talking about compliance with the board policy on maintaining the minimum levels and yet still allowing for flexibility in times of emergency or very exceptional times, which we are still on the heels of everything that was happening with our pandemic situation. So this definitely qualifies as we go, as we continue to go into next year. So as I've been speaking about, and we'll talk more about that. Budget development timelines, just highlighting where we are. We're just still in the briefings. We're giving briefings. As I get more information, I'm bringing those to you and giving you some kind of high level a bit so you can see where we are in our development of getting to our budget. Our first real draft of the official budget document in the formal format is July 10. So I will have a budget draft for you then. And then we go back and we keep fine tuning and keep making a few corrections that we know need to be made. And then August 8, we'll have our budget hearing and propose for adoption the budget. So th that's kind of where we're at with the, the main things that are yet to come with the timelines. I have last meeting that, or last time I did a budget development, I shared our enrollment estimates. So the board had approved next year's enrollment and estimate in a February board meeting. And then I have utilized those, that data to drive our revenue estimates. And it also drives our staffing levels where we're targeted to how much, how many staff members we need in each area. I've extrapolated and uh, done a projection because part of our requirements in coming to you in our July meeting is that we have to have a four year budget summary. So we project out four years and we do that with enrollment too then. And so this is what I had brought to more summarized level at this juncture. Um, but this was also based on the flow analytics uh, consultant that we utilized in looking at all the demographics and facets that go into making those kind of projections. So those numbers are there. You can see those. We are projecting to be increasing. And uh, if we do indeed increase by the amount we project next year, then we will be pretty close to being on par with the level of enrollment that we had before we experienced that big drop that was with the COVID pandemic. And then just moderate conservative growth over the next three years. Coming to revenue estimates, and I'll try to make that a little bigger. There we go. So I have got a next year's estimate of what our revenues are gonna be by the three main funding sources, state, federal, and, and our local money, which is tax revenue and other local things like interest earnings, um, food and nutrition services, uh, meal payments and things like that, facility rentals. So you can see I've laid out next year's estimate of where we think we'll be for revenues is 87, 0.4 million, that first far, first column on the far left. The column on the far right is the amount that that 
source has increased compared to last year's budget. And I've got the projection for the next four years. And I'm sorry, I explained that first column incorrectly. <laughs> I'm just now realizing. The far left column is our this year's revenue. The next column is our projected for next year. So 88.4 million. And then that's a close to a million more than we received last year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So enrollment increases is driving up the state revenues. If you look at the top column there, total state funds, that's where we are showing our biggest increase. Our federal funds though are sharply decreasing and that is because most of the COVID related funds are discontinued at this juncture and we will have fully spent or exhausted them. And our local funds do show an increase as well. That is mostly because we're returning to pre-COVID operations and activities. So I talked about that the state funds are 5 million more than prior years. And that funding coming from the state does incorporate what they utilized for a inflationary adjustment or a cost of living adjustment that they provide for us. And it also incorporates the regionalization factor decrease. So we learn about that as a board as we're talking about the things that influence our revenues and that is one of them. So factor is going to de keep decreasing every year until they do a rebase at the legislative level. And again, our federal funds, 5.5 million less than prior years. So they basically almost closely offset each other. Um, the federal ESPER funds will be depleted. Our emergency connectivity funds were one-time funds. And the federal waivers around our school meal programs will be coming to an end. And I think I pretty much, this slide is kind of duplicated. So I think I'll just mostly talk about the staffing costs that our human resources department is really busy uh, building all the data and the crunching that needs to happen to get our biggest cost piece into the system. 86% of our total budget is salary and benefits for all of the very valuable people that we have. So we're still um, working on getting that compiled and that will be in the first round draft budget that comes to you in July. I have had some peaks at the total of what that will be, but it's not in a format that would be very meaningful for you to look at right now. <laughs> so just awareness of the big picture, the 2022-23 revenues and expenditures are greater than last year. Our expenditures are going to outpace and exceed the revenues based on our planned staffing levels. And that has been intentional. Our budgeted ending fund balance will be impacted. And we have intentionally, rather than reducing force, we have in chosen to dip into our fund balance. We have been lucky to have a large reserve, even over above what we would typically hold. So in this time, we may just be down to the minimum. We may be dipping a little under, but that's what I'm fine tuning. And I will do a four-year projection on that. So you'll get to see the trend going out the four years. So I already talked about the next timeline coming to the board in July and then coming again in August with, we have a, a public hearing. And then later in the meeting, we, we uh, propose a resolution to adopt. Are there any questions? Awesome. Well. You guys have listened very closely and I've been here a lot of times. So thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you very much, Gina, keeping us informed and, and uh, 
detail oriented and big picture thinking all at the same time. Um, thank you for sharing this. That was just an informational item for the board. Um, next up, we have a new program proposal, and this is our K-8 Arlington online program. And this will be presented by, it looks like Carrie, and then maybe also another Carrie. It's like, it's a Carrie guy. It's our theme. You can never have too many Carries. Uh, just want to um, introduce Carrie Marsh, the principal of SVLC and our Arlington online program. Um, there's a little bit of irony in what we're bringing you today because this program has actually been expanded for the last two years. With COVID closure, we knew we needed to act quickly and expand our online offerings for families. Um, and so the program has actually been up and running, but we we want to make it permanent. So that's why we're bringing to you the program proposal tonight. And then after that, the materials to go along with the program. So that being said, here's Carrie Marsh. Good evening. I'm Carrie Marsh, principal of Stillaguamish Valley Learning Center. And at the Stillaguamish Valley Learning Center, we have three programs. We're an ALE school, which stands for Alternative Learning Experience. And the state designates three programs that we can run an on-site, an online, and remote. And here in Arlington, we have all three offerings. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Arlington Online Program. And first, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we got started or how we got here today. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so when we had the first COVID closure in March, when we all had to go away and we weren't allowed to be here, we knew that the next year was going to look a little bit different. Dr. Sweeting started talking early on about expanding our current online. So we've had 912 AOP, Arlington Online Program. There's a lot of letters. The 912 AOPs existed for quite some time and it's successful and wonderful and serves students well. So Dr. Sweeting started talking about expanding that option for K-8. We knew some kids weren't going to be able to come into the building or feel comfortable coming into the building. So I started talking with other ALE principals about options and um, what kind of curriculum we could use. For our 912, we use APEX, but APEX only goes down to sixth grade. Um, I heard a lot about Edgenuity. You might have heard that name. That's a really big company. Edgenuity uses online programs from K through 12, but I found a loophole. They were hard to get a hold of that, that summer. And the loophole I found was from a principal in Puyallup who told me that Accelerate Education is who Edgenuity contracts with for their K-8. So we essentially cut out the middleman and went right to Accelerate Education, which saved us a little bit of money. And since they are a lesser known company than Edgenuity, it was cheaper. And we had access to a rep right away. We used uh, Accelerate Education in our first year with uh, our K-5. And we got pretty good rate or reviews from our uh, parents. Our teachers dug in. I, I think it was like the second day of school, am I right? And we met kids online and did our Zoom class and then teachers jumped into professional development. We really, they're so awesome. They learned as they went step-by-step step with the kids. And our feedback from parents was it's good. They didn't love the videos. They thought they were outdated. And when we talked with the company at the end of last year, they said they had gotten that feedback and they had made a substantial amount of money because everybody needed online education and they revamped it quite a bit. Uh, one of the benefits of, oh, we'll go into the benefits in a minute. Um, at that, that first year, we also did Apex for 6-8 because we were familiar with it and our teachers knew it and, our, and many of our students knew it. After reviewing after the first year, we really liked that Accelerate Education had more hands-on, it felt more comprehensive, and it really feels like homeschooling, except we're providing the support and the curriculum. Um, so we used this year as our first year using Accelerate Education for 6-8, and we've seen quite a difference in terms of engagement, and um, skill development. Did I cover that all? Yes. Uh, we're, we talk with parents and families, that's a staple of SVLC. So we get a lot of feedback. And I will say from our teachers to our parents, both of them agree that 
accelerated education is much more appropriate for 6-8. And so this year we did uh, K-8. Next slide. I'm gonna introduce um, some people here, some of our teachers that we brought and talk to you a little bit about our, our structure of support. So again, it's still all run through SVLC. Uh, we use our office secretary and registrar, and then myself. Um, they, the three of us work for all three programs. And then our teachers, we have Erin Green, who teaches kinder and first grade on-site. She also manages kinder and first grade online. We have Amanda Andrews, who isn't here today, who teaches second and third grade on-site and works with second, third, and fourth online. And Kimmy Johnson works with only online, and she works fifth, with fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade AOP kiddos. And then we have Elena Radford, who is uh, a teacher that supports our AOP students with IEPs. Uh, the instruction for AOP courses are built into the Accelerate Education program. So our teachers, Erin, uh, Amanda, and Kimmy, they're not uh, designing instruction and delivering it. They're supporting the instruction that AE provides. Uh, they do help them by managing their learning plan, having weekly contact. Uh, this year, Kimmy was really successful with some social emotional learning groups, especially fifth and sixth grade. Uh, seventh and eighth graders didn't enjoy it quite as much. Uh, but they are required to have a weekly check-in. So our teachers are facilitating that. And then our parents are required to have a monthly meeting. So they are supporting those monthly meetings. And really, like everything in education, we know that the relationships is what's going to make it great. So we have great teachers. I'm going to let them come up and share. Um, oh, they're so excited. They're going to come up and share uh, a little more about the program that they work with every day. Hi, I'm Erin Green. I'm the kinder and first grade teacher on site and um, online. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so here are some of the strengths of AE. There's various ways to show student learning, um, technology, written work, projects, um, like science projects. We uh, apply all the materials for them for science projects. Um, courses provide information in different formats, such as written, video, audio, and some exploration. And this was great for my kinders who couldn't read quite yet. Um, they can click a little speaker and it reads to them, which is great. Um, opportunities to modify work for individual students as needed. Um, everything standard-based, individualized, self-paced courses are intended to keep students on track for graduation. Um, and this is great because I have some kids who wanted to finish early. So a couple of my students finished two weeks early, which is great so they could go on summer vacation. Um, all students are able to have schedules that are tailored to their individual needs. For example, there are some students that are unable to attend school for health reasons. Uh, this program shows diversity and offers various viewpoints and opinions within the program. Student opportunities to reattempt work as needed or desired. So if they just they contact us if they just don't feel like they did their best, we can let them have a little retry. Uh, tracks mastery of Common Core state standards for us as teachers and weekly progress reports sent to the parents' emails every Sunday so they're not caught off guard with their students. So, yeah. I just have a quick question. Yeah. Is this done in conjunction with in-person or is this truly just the online program? Just the online program. Okay. Yes. Okay, she can talk more about that. Okay, <laughs> okay thanks. Okay. The next slide I think I can we go to the yep. Oh, okay, I'll do Amanda's. Okay. So um, interactive videos with workbooks that coincide with the lessons. Um, this is what she was, Carrie was talking about how they updated them because they were literally from like 1970s. And so um, they updated, the, updated those. Um, immediate feedback within AE, embedded online practice activities to offer additional online practice in basic mathematical skills. So students receive points in the grade book for completing the weekly activities. K through five science courses use a mixture of exploring the world around them combined with hands-on experiences using nature or common household items, which we provide. Social study courses includes topics such as rules and consequences for different cultures around the world. Okay, next slide. Um, to answer your question for middle school, um, right now I do weekly grade level check-ins via Zoom because a lot of my students aren't able to come on campus. Um, but next year we are hoping to push for coming on campus at least one hour a week 
uh, to continue to build that relationship and support families as well as students um, as they're working through the program. Um, let's see, so the students, uh, the lessons and videos are paired with activities on PDFs that the students can complete online so they don't have to print out copies. Um, for fifth grade, they are provided K through fifth, they are provided workbooks so they can handwrite, which is more practice for them. Um, but six through eight is all online PDFs, but they also can get them printed out um, as needed. Um, students are given two attempts on quizzes, which give them immediate feedback that they can use, and they can use that as a way to study in order to take it again. All assignments um, have rubrics that go along with them, as well as personalized feedback that is given by me or their teacher. Um, they're given practice questions throughout the lesson to check for understanding and given immediate answers so that they know if they've got it right, um, if they're on track. Assignments, quizzes, and exams are all scored in one place so the students know how to check their grades. And that's something that we go over with them at monthly progress, them and their parents. And there are opportunities for student choice embedded in every single class. Most projects, um, or at least multiple times within a module, they're given two to three opportunities to pick how they would like to complete an assignment. Uh, social studies encourages students to look outside of what they know uh, to learn more about their direct community as well as the world around them. Science has a combination of hands-on experiment, research and scientific thinking assignments. Ma the math lessons move through the curriculum in a way that supports building upon prior knowledge and language arts uses journals to support students in writing essays so that they're learning parts about how to strengthen their essays um, and write more successfully uh, when they turn in their final essays. Yeah. Is there one more slide or is that it? Possibly one more slide. Questions? <laughs> Does our student advisor have any questions about this new program? <laughs> I have a question. Anybody else? <laughs> um, my question is, and maybe I just missed it, so I apologize if I did, but I was wondering about the frequency of interaction with their peers and teachers. So it does vary a little bit with kinder and first and then second through fourth. Uh, I know, I don't know how many times you guys meet a week every Friday and then second through fourth does the same thing they meet every Friday um fifth through six I have a little bit more flexibility because I don't have a physical in-person class um so they have AOP drop-in hours where they can come in at any time between those hours and work I call it Starbucks style where they're all working independently because I have so many different grade levels um but it's a great time to interact with me and kids of other grades and then I actually have grade specific Zooms so that I can meet them more at their level. Um, we'll talk about what assignments they're at. They're all reading different novels. So sometimes um, I'll ask them which novel they're reading and then they can talk to each other about what part they're at at the novel um, to just kind of get that communication going, which is what I'm hoping to push for next year is that they come in more on site. And uh, especially for eighth grade math, I noticed there was uh, more support needed in eighth grade math because it has some really challenging topics. And so I'm hoping to start something that's a little bit more catered at supporting that for next year. Thank you very much for presenting. Nicely done. So this is an action item on our agenda. Um, there's, there's two action items for this topic. There's the new program proposal and then the next item is the new instructional materials. So I think they covered both of them adequately. So if we could um, entertain a motion. I make a motion we approve the new program for the Ar Arlington online program. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the new program for K-8 Arlington online program. Can we take a vote? Sure. Director Kelly. Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. All right, the program is adopted. Next up is the instructional materials to accompany the program. And that is that Accelerate Education that was um, presented. Do we have a motion? I make a motion we approve the new instructional materials for Accelerate Education. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the Accelerate Education Online Instructional Materials. Madam Clerk, can we take a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. 
Um, congratulations. Thank you for all that you do for our students. We appreciate you. Um, next up, we have our, um, our briefing of our capital facilities plan for 2022. And that will be by Brian. I don't see Brian. Oh, Brian's on Zoom. I'm online, Mary. Oh, it's welcome. It's Try. good to see you at the beach. That sounds lovely. So take Thank it away, you. Brian Lewis, Executive Director um, of Operations. Thanks, Mary. So uh, as Mary said tonight, I'm uh, presenting you an informational briefing regarding uh, our capital facilities plan. Uh, and this is for information only. There will be uh, action in August. Uh, the capital facilities plan is required under Washington's Growth Management Act to identify additional school facilities uh, to meet our needs, uh, to meet the district's needs. Uh, and as Britt Kleinman said earlier, uh, there there is a, another document that we have called a master facilities plan. Uh, and the two documents are distinct uh, in that the capital facilities plan is required by law and the master facilities plan is um, a task that the district takes on uh, without any kind of legislative definition. It's, it's how we use uh, the information in part provided by the capital facilities plan to, to plan for our own needs. Capital facilities plan does not uh, take and uh, our support facilities or uh, our raw land facilities. Well, Brian, mentioned can I ask you to speak a little louder? Can you talk a little louder? Uh, hopefully I can. Is, is that better? Yes, thank you. You guys, okay. Uh, so um, the, there is a draft of the plan attached to the board agenda uh, as well as this uh, presentation and, and the, the Contents of the plan include an enrollment forecast um, uh, provided both by uh, OSPI, uh, the cohort uh, survival enrollment projection, and the forecast, the uh, enrollment forecast created by Flow Analytics, for which we engaged earlier this year. Uh, there's also a, a component in there that I didn't mention in the report here, but it is the the generation, the student generation rate, uh, which uh, is a uh, a description of how many students each housing unit by type, single family home, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom plus uh, multifamily uh, provides for the school district's enrollment. So in addition to the enrollment forecast, uh, there's an inventory of the district's existing facilities, uh, proposed financing plan, and then the calculation of impact fees with the supporting data, which includes student generation rate. So we reinstituted uh, the impact fee in 2019. Uh, and since that time, uh, we didn't begin collecting them until 2020, uh, but there was a process that we had to go through with Snohomish County and the city of Arlington. Since that time, uh, we've collected $920,454 as of the end of April. Uh, this, uh, these funds can be used to purchase sites for instructional buildings, uh, to purchase portable classrooms and infrastructure improvements to support those uh, portable buildings, or it can be used to build instructional buildings on site. Can't be used for support facilities, so we can't use them for transportation, uh, maintenance, uh, food service, any of the buildings that don't provide an instructional purpose. The schedule uh, is for today, we're uh, present, I'm presenting the draft to you. Uh, in July, uh, we've got to do uh, some work in terms of uh, informing our community that we're uh, conducting this process. Uh, in August, I will bring to you a finalized report. Uh, we did submit the draft report to Snohomish County uh, at the end of May or end of April, excuse me. Uh, just received some comments back from them two weeks ago, uh, made changes, uh, that, and we'll incorporate those changes into the, the revised uh, document that we submit back to them. Uh, and then we'll come to you in August for uh, your adoption of the plan. Uh, throughout the summer, uh, the City of Arlington Planning Commission will be uh, considering the plan as well, uh, and the Snohomish County Planning Commission. 
and then we expect the, the uh, Snohomish County Planning or Snohomish County Council to adopt all the impact uh, plan, the capital facilities plans in the county. There's multiple districts that submit these uh, that, that will be uh, adopted by the Snohomish County Council in the fall of 2020. Uh, the differences between now and our, our between our current plan and what um, uh, we have in our updated plan. There's a small increase uh, in the single family residence fee uh, and a decrease in the multifamily residence fee. And that's got some, you know, something to do with the number of students that each type of uh, housing unit generates uh, as far as a, a, that attend our schools. So uh, once uh, the board has the opportunity to consider uh, and adopt the plan in August, we notify the city council and the city council incorporates it into their comprehensive plan and uh, we'll be able to collect updated fees uh, beginning in july of 2023 uh, the snohomish county council will uh, adopt all the plans in fall of 22 and we begin adopting uh, or excuse me we begin collecting uh, updated fees in january of 2023 that's the extent of my presentation at this point. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have or research them for answering in August. Does our student advisor have any awesome questions about facilities? I do not at this time, sorry. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Next up is my favorite thing, and, and it's um, our full calendar adoption for 2022 to 2023. And I know everybody is so excited for this. We're just super thrilled to welcome Eric DeYoung, our Executive Director of Human Resources, to present us all the fun days. I'm back. Hi. Uh, yes, here's the, we presented earlier in the year, a couple months ago, I believe, the kind of the key dates uh, was spring break, winter break, those kinds of things. So this is coming back to you with all of the full dates, including uh, conference days, the early release days. Um, I think that's about it, actually. The new, that's Those are the new things that weren't on the original one that you approved. So this is what we came up with. Also, the quarter dates are on here. Eric, do you mind sharing how much work goes into preparing and um, completing this task and how many meetings you've had and how many people have been involved in this process? Yeah, well, quite a few. Carrie um, Henderson-Burke actually took the lead on the conferences for the elementary, which is a change for us because we're going from a trimester to a semester and quarter system for our elementaries too. So that was a big change. So I'll give it up to Carrie, and I'm not sure how many meetings she had around that with her uh, and surveys and et cetera. So there was quite a few things going on there. Um, other than that, I know she also worked on the, the Fridays um, and there's more detail behind this, like who owns the day and who controls the, the work time that's associated with those early release days. So that's kind of behind the scenes of this as well. So there's a lot that goes into the calendar in general. Yeah, another thing is making, ensuring that we have the instructional hours for the year. So we're required from the State Board of Education to have no less than 1,027 hours as an average across the, the system. And so we, we've uh, done that analysis and this meets that. So. And Dr. Sweeting did, does all the calculations for that. With some help with Debbie, I think also is running some, some spreadsheets as well. Eric, quick question. Yeah. Could you confirm for me again? Are we going to, what are we on now as a system and what are we going to? Are we going to trimesters or just semesters? I was confused. Well, we use, well, we currently are on semesters and quarters for the middle school and high school. And the elementary was on trimesters and the elementary is joining the secondary in quarters, semesters next year. Yep. Which changed some of our conferences and times. Yeah. I will note, so um, this next year there, the elementary have 
uh, through the conversations that Carrie's had with, with um, various individuals, teachers, and uh, principals. Uh, there's going to be a week of conferences, the October 31st that week, and then another week Typically, we've only had three days in March, but we're going to have a full week. And you'll notice there's kind of a salmon color. So at the end of that November, that November week, that salmon color represents elementary have conferences, but secondary have the hour and 15 minutes that they get out early. So that's why there's a different color there. It's pretty complicated. <laughs> there's a lot of going on there. Yeah, it's lots of different colors. I think they had to come up with some new colors and then what we used to have. So yeah, busy. We like all the colors. It is pretty, your, yes. Um, this is an action item for the board to approve the complete 22-23 public school student calendar. I make a motion that we adopt the full calendar for 22-23. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the 22-23 school calendar as presented. Madam Chair, can we take a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, the calendar is adopted. We look forward to the next school year. It's gonna be awesome. Next up, we have a contract for services with Strategies 360. And this will be presented again by Brian Lewis. Oh, and Gary. Good evening, directors. Gary Sable, Director of Communications. I'm tag teaming with Brian Lewis virtually, so I'm, I'm kind of tag teaming here. Um, Brian, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so I, I think uh, Brian's going to start can first. You, and then I'll... Oh. Yes, we hear you just fine, Brian. Thank you. So Brian's going to start first, oh. and then I'll okay. chime in, and then I think we're in with Brian. So. Okay, so um, tonight we're bringing to you a proposed contract for services with Strategies 360, a uh, public relations firm. Uh, one of their specialties is uh, working with schools on strategic communications. Uh, we began working with Strategies 360 in 2019, prior to the February 2020 uh, bond and levy election. At that election, we had three measures before voters, uh, one an EP&O or educational programs and operations levy, uh, one a capital uh, projects levy, and one a bond measure. Uh, two out of three of those measures passed. Uh, the bond measure, unfortunately, did not reach the 60% uh, supermajority requirement to be considered approved. Uh, we did receive 54% approval on that bond. and. 56% uh, each on the capital levy and the EPNO levy. Uh, we find ourselves uh, in 2024 reaching the expiration of both our educational programs and operations levy and the uh, capital projects levy. Uh, we've got parallel efforts uh, occurring with the facilities advisory committee uh, to formulate uh, facilities uh, recommendation to the superintendent uh, in time for the <clears throat> board's consideration uh, for the February 24 election. Uh, any kind of uh, board action uh, that would have to be taken uh, to get questions on the ballot in February 2024 uh, would have to be adopted by December 16th, 2023. So that's the history that we've got with Strategies 360. It was a very productive relationship, and we're looking to continue it. So now Gary's going to talk about the different kinds of work that they would do for us under this contract. Great. Thanks, Brian. So the, where are we at here? So the, the first part of There we go. Okay. <laughs> so th this is kind of what we want to look at for this coming year. And to give a little background, so we started uh, this process in 2019. And actually, I've, I've heard of S360 from previous election conferences I attended. And then I attended a school PR conference in April 2019 and, and talked with uh, Leslie, the, the rep at S360. And that kind of 
brought that back and kind of started with that. And, and Brian, of course, been instrumental in that as well. And, and one of the things that through the um, this public opinion research that they did for us in uh, 2019 was they really talked about that grassroots effort, really talking about how to, um, you know, let people know about the need for for posts and some of the other projects that are happening. And, um, and so that's why, you know, we started this in, you know, later in 2019, but it's better to go earlier. And that's why it's like kind of that two year process before the February 2024 elections. That's really kind of what this purpose is right now is to really kind of, as this talks about the public opinion research, really getting that feedback, you know, from community members and families to find out what do they know about it? You know, how, how can we improve in those things? And so that's what this first part, this public opinion research is really to, um, you know, survey the, the families and community members and get that feedback so we can craft the messages in that next part. And, the, and I work closely with them, like in the, the, the previous election for uh, February 2020, I work close with them on a lot of these projects. And so, you know, they're the, the experts in this. And so I, I just support them in, in that process. And so you see the messaging framework, different things like that. Um, they have like a communications plan they put together and, and we implement, oh, we implement that. Oh, it kind of went up a little bit. There it is. So this implementation, it talks about, you know, they, they you know, work, they create ads for us. Um, and that's where I work with them on our social media piece. I send those out, but they help craft the message for that, the images, all the different graphics, different things like that. And so we utilize th their services to send that out. And it's really, again, to educate and let folks know about the purpose for the upcoming election. Do you want to scroll down a little bit, please? We'll talk about the social media graphics, that's some of that stuff. The, the digital media, that's all part of that. We also do a uh, YouTube, uh, Strategy 360, the last election helped us create, they created the videos, but we did a lot of support on the back end to help them with that. Um, and those were very effective. They all come with metrics to show how effective those are and they show all the different hits, all those different things. And as Brian mentioned, it, it, they're very successful. We passed uh, the two levies and you know, we're close on the bomb, but we weren't as successful with the bomb. But it's really just, like I said, creating that grassroots effort. And so that's the purpose of, of doing all this. Any questions, at least from this part? Yeah, sure, Cherry. One question I had was how soon, um, I know you gave me a deadline, something like December, 2023, which is not this year, but the following year. Mm -hmm. And then that would be for the February, 2024, that's right. correct. And then this is just for, for the this coming year. This is again to kind of build that that knowledge base, you know, letting folks know, you know, first getting feedback from them, but then sharing information with them so they're aware of what's happening, the, the need to replace posts. And so that's why we're starting this process earlier than we did the previous time, because that was their recommendation. They said typically, you know, if we start with them earlier, you can help build up that that grassroots effort. I remember being on the community. Remember, we had something on Zoom, community voices. I didn't do it this year, but the year before. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking with parents who were at the elementary level from maybe Eagle Creek, and they were gung-ho to get started on something because they know the future is their kiddos going to post. So I think that it would be very critical that, yes, we jump on this ASAP. And I would also recommend that we um, bring this up to our ACE meeting, have maybe your S360 people show up at an ACE meeting. And I would then also have maybe the principals at those schools where we need great participation and i would do a weekly in their weekly newsletters just calling it and, and i know between the teachers and the admin they know people who are involved they know people like me and mary and erica you know and maybe mike as well just you know that's where that's we sought out information because we wanted to be participatory and those people are out there you just got to pull them in and and then that will be your, I think, will be your grassroots. And I think going to the people who know where their kids are going into those places that are in great need, get them now and you'll have those couple of years and say, we need your conversations in the community. We need your voice in the community now so that when we do that bond measure in February 24, we have that, we can have that a little bit better locked up because I don't think that super majority is going away. So anyway, just some ideas I thought. Great, thank you. And I'd like to say this. Sherry, is can I address one of your oh, can I address one of your points, Sherry? Yep. Um, the we do we do have 
uh, Gary and Gina and I have a meeting scheduled with Strategies 360 on June 21st uh, to begin that, that very same process that you just spoke about. You can see this line item here, interviews with key stakeholders. Uh, at that meeting, uh, we're going to start working on identifying who those key stakeholders are uh, that Strategies 360 will, will begin discussions with. So that, that is certainly something that we're interested in doing. I uh, also want to be clear that this is not solely about the bond. This is also about uh, the educational programs and operations levy, which is most important to us. Uh, and you know, there are some common misconceptions um, out in the world about the purpose of the EPNO and the need for it. And you can see this on social media following any school election uh, that, you know, there's a, this you and cry, why are you asking me again uh, for tax money? Why? Uh, I thought McCleary fully funded schools. What's the need for this? So you know, we're, we're anticipating those kinds of questions and providing uh, information prior, well in advance uh, of the election to help, help people understand why it is that we're asking EPNO money in particular. Yeah, and I, I think that's very important, Brian. Thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. It's it's more than just the bond, of course, and um, you need the generation of funds to keep the other programs for sure going. I think that I know myself and Mary were on the phone calls with that last election cycle, and I think a lot of our community members, especially the retirees, are not always understanding that, and it's just, it's just misinformation or a lack of information, and so when you have those phone calls, seems like a little bit late in the game to be educating people. So the sooner we can do that and have our community really understand how the funding works, the better. Um, and, and, and I would just say yeah, constant messaging and clear messaging, right? That's, that's the key. Thanks. Thanks, Brian, for clarifying. And I just wanted to note that this is phase one. There will be a phase two. So the phase one goes from uh, this June until next June or next May, actually. Then we'll be coming back to the board with phase two. All right, I do have a question now. Awesome. <laughs> and my question for you was, uh, I noticed you mentioned working uh, with them before in 2019 and then 2020. So how influential would you say that was? Like uh, how much of an impact did that work have? It, the, the, the parts I worked on them with, I was more the social media, communications, publications, that sort of thing. I, I thought it was critical. I, I thought it, you know, it was invaluable, their service they provide to us. Um, and obviously the result that they really helped us pass the, the capital levy and the EPNO levy. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know, the, it was a great partnership. It worked really well. Thank you very much. Yeah, good question. And Kyle, I, I'll add that uh, there were many districts around us that were running levies at the same time as we were and did not gain voter approval in February. Uh, they had to come back in August, or excuse me, April or August uh, and do an, uh, you know, a campaign all over again. So, you know, I can't, I don't have any empirical evidence to, to show that that was the reason why we didn't, we, we passed and, and those other districts didn't, but I know that those districts were not using uh, any kind of uh, consulting service like this uh, that helps uh, design strategic communication. So I, I, I can only conclude that it was positive for us uh, to use the, the service last time. Good to know, thank you very much. Um, does this $50,000 cover both phases? Uh, just the first phase, just this year. And Mike, we'll negotiate uh, for phase two uh, later next year. Thank you. Brian, can you also share what happens uh, to a school district if they don't pass their EPNO levy? Like a neighboring district of ours, perhaps, how much money are they now struggling to, um, to struggle well, with? Well, if their budget is similar to ours, then they're going to lose 12% of their operating budget. Uh, for And it really takes, um, they can come back and pass another levy uh, in the following calendar year. They won't begin collection on that levy until the year after. So they're really going for a year and a half uh, with no local levy collections at all. Uh, and it, it, it can, so that's 12% of our budget, which is 
Uh, I, I think for, for uh, Gina, um, can you help me remember how much our levy collections are in terms of dollars for EP&O? Gina there? Yes, she is. One second. <laughs> She's running to the microphone. It's 9.5, I think, for 2022, and then a little bit more, 9.8 million uh, next year. And, and given... Uh, Thank you, Gina. And given that our 86% um, you know, of our budget is spent on staffing and associated benefits, there's really not a whole lot of places to go uh, in terms of cost cutting. There's a, a bare minimum of uh, material supplies and operating costs we have to maintain. Uh, so unfortunately, we we're faced with a decision of uh, consuming fund balance or cutting costs. You know, most of the time, if there's you know, sufficient fund balance, it's a, it's a combination of the two, but, you know, if we're in a position where we don't have sufficient fund balance, it's the staff reductions that absorb the, the brunt of the loss. It takes quite a while for an organization to recover from that. Thank you for explaining, Brian and Gina and all. Any further questions? Brian, did you have more to share or was that it? That's it. All right, thank you. Um, this is an action item. We have a motion to approve the contract with Strategy 360. I make a motion we extend or have the contract for services with Strategies 360. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the proposed contract with Strategies 360 as presented. Madam Clerk, can we take a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you. The motion passes and Thank that you. contract is approved. Thank you all. Next up, we have uh, another item of business. I wanted to just ask the group, do we need to take a quick five minute break? Um, the board is going to need to take a five minute little break. So we will stand in recess for five minutes from 7.40 to 7.45, and then we'll come back with more.
All right, welcome back. Thank you for allowing um, board members to recess. Um, next up, we're going to have an action item that is school board director redistricting. And this will be presented by Brian Lewis. And I think he has a special guest. Is McKay with us also? Okay, Brian. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you again, ahead. directors. Um, we are, oh, okay. We're on um, the third um, meeting in re regards to uh, presenting director districts redistricting. Uh, this is triggered by the 2020 census. Uh, and the director, and I'll let McKay explain in more detail, but this is a legislatively required process uh, to make sure that we've got balanced representation in our districts. At the first two meetings uh, where we presented and we provided you with draft uh, maps, uh, tonight uh, we've got uh, a presentation from McKay covering the final draft maps and then a proposed resolution following in the next agenda item uh, to adopt one map in particular. Uh, so I'm going to let McKay take it from here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, directors, for having me here again um, to present um, to you your, your final map options for redistricting. Just as Brian had mentioned, um, Special districts are required to redistrict with the um, uh, decennial census uh, release. Um, it was released last year, last fall. Um, and so we are looking at what uh, your current population balance is, um, the, the demographics within those, and then um, trying to bring it into balance. Um, so you're currently a little high. And so we, we're this process is meant to bring that uh, population deviation or that deviation range down. Um, so I have a presentation that I'd like to share with you all. Can you all see my screen okay? Okay, great. Um, so th this is one of the biggest things that I always like to emphasize is that this is not a boundary review. This process will not affect where your student attends school. Um, this is only, we are only talking about school board director districts. Um, and the directors, as you know, are elected at large by everyone throughout the district, but they do uh, represent the, the district in which they live. And so that's what we're looking at um, today. But keep that in mind. Um, I think it's on every slide. So um, here's a look at, at what Brian had mentioned. Um, you've got the, the phases of the project here in, um, in color block. And then you've got um, each of the milestones um, throughout the project. So we are on um, our, our final redistricting map meeting um, for adoption. Um, so we've come a long way. Um, it's not uh, due until November 22nd, but it's always really helpful to have this in for the county auditor since they're stitching everything together, getting ready for um, the actual elections. So the overall redistricting requirements to keep in mind um, for this process is the number one must is it must be population balanced. Again, we want, um, you'll see um, overall deviation is what we're gonna refer to it as. We're talking about total population, not only those that are citizens or voting age population. Um, so we need to be population balanced. We want to get that overall range under 10% and we really want it under 5%. We always want to strive for 0%, so equal numbers in each district. Um, districts must be contiguous, so they can't reach over a, a different district and grab a, a center of population. Uh, redistricting must be drawn in compliance with all local, state, and federal laws, and this process is doing that. Uh, redistricting must not be done to favor or disfavor a protected class or political party. Um, and I might stop here and just mention again that flow is not uh, does not represent any political party. We are merely looking at census blocks and census uh, demographics. Uh, districts should be as compact as possible, which becomes more of a comparative measure. Um, districts should preserve communities of mutual interest. Um, districts should um, should not split census blocks. Um, the census blocks are the building blocks of the actual districts. And then um, those census blocks tend to follow natural and artificial boundaries anyways, but it is important um, to try to, to utilize um, those features um, as your boundaries. 
for your director districts. Um, so I'm gonna present the three final map options and I'm gonna go through the maps first, but keep in mind, you're currently at about 10.5% 10, 10 overall deviation. That's the number that we're trying to get down um, towards zero. So I'm gonna explain the maps since that's where everybody, everybody's eyes go to first. Um, what you're looking at here is the, this dark blue line is the current director districts. Um, and then you have the color block underneath which is representative of the statistics that you're looking at up here and up here. So your overall deviation is 4.2 with this map um, and the changes within. So if you can see this area here was within district four in this uh, final map option one, this area has now turned yellow. So that population goes to district two in this map. Um, there's a, a very small uh, census block here that actually um, moves from three to two. Um, that is, uh, it's a population center that doesn't have any population there, um, but it keeps uh, tribal lands together into one district. Um, you'll also note um, that we also have Arlington in the, um, the dotted black line here. Um, so you can see where it extends. And then uh, one more thing to mention is that the color block is representing the census blocks. And since we can't split the census blocks and they change every 10 years, the geometries do. So areas like this, the center of this, this is one large census block and the center falls within district one. So that population of that block counts in district one. So you'll see kind of some inconsistencies uh, throughout. But the main changes in population um, are here and here for, um, for this uh, final map option one. This is the least change um, and it is it gets the deviation under 5%. So it's at 4.2%. You can see the, the highest over is district four um, at 106 over the ideal population um, line for 1.6%. And the lowest under is district one at negative 179 below the ideal population number for negative 2.7%. So you, you add 2.7% plus 1.6% plus a rounding error and you get that 4.2%. So that is final map option one. Final map option two has more change of course because it is the lowest deviation of the three. Um, with this is the lowest deviation with the least amount of change, meaning that the population movements are direct from one district to another, um, not necessarily moving population through districts to, to make other districts whole. But you can see that the differences here are um, this area of district five moves from district five into district four, hence the change from blue to the red purplish color. Um, again, this small little block here, changes and then there's a population change up here in district four from district four to district two. You can see that area turns yellow. Um, there is this um, kind of outreach in district two that uh, falls right here that this population would change from district two to district one. And then there's a very small census block, um, not a lot of folks uh, in that census block, but it does change from district one to district three. So that is um, the uh, lowest deviation with the least amount of change and it does follow artificial natural boundaries as much as possible. Um, and this one you have uh, pretty much um, all trending towards zero, but your lowest under is 12 under um, in district three for 0.2% um, and your highest over is district five with 11 over the ideal population line for 0.2%. You add the 0 0.2 plus the 0 0.2 plus that rounding error and you get that 0.3%. And then final option three um, has a slightly uh, different take. It is a, um, there's a lot of change um, in this map, um, but it was uh, the considerations were compactness in this case. Um, so trying to get two um, over this kind of uh, reach over, trying to get it more compact um, also causing um, four to take on more population from district one here. Um, district one takes on population from two here. Um, you've got district two taking on a bunch of population from district four. 
same thing here, taking on population from District 3 um, and a small movement there with um, District 5's population moving into District 4. Uh, there's also uh, these blocks out here, not highly populated, but they are populated um, moving from District uh, 1 into District 3, hence the change from the green to, to the purple or blue. Um, this overall deviation is 2.3%. Um, that is coming from District 4, which is uh, still over by 78 people for 1.2%. And the lowest under is District 1, um, negative 73 under that ideal population line for 1.1%, negative 1.1%. You add the 1.1 plus the 1.2 and you get that 2.3%. So those are the final three options. Um, and I will hand it back over um, to you all for discussion, um, what we heard, I will mention that um, what, what we heard in discussions um, in the last meeting is that um, this final option two was um, being leaned towards, but we wanted to give all five, oh, sorry, all three map options um, for you all to discuss. Discussion. Oh, um, directors, in the next agenda item, uh, there is also a, um, <clears throat> a, a draft resolution or a resolution uh, ready for your consideration that uh, adopts map option two uh, as the, the new director districts. Uh, during the, your last meeting, while you did not take action, formal action, uh, you expressed a general sense that uh, this map option two was the preferred map uh, with some changes that McKay had made after the first draft uh, because of the overall deviation rate being at point. So. Grace, if I understand this correctly, um, Brian, we discuss it and then we decide on which one of the three maps we like the best with an action item. And then the next step would be to adopt that resolution. Um, even if we go a different That's direction, correct. we'd have to change and, and, right? and if the preferred map option is not to, uh, we can bring back another resolution at a, at a later date. Uh, these resolutions are complex uh, because of the legal descriptions that are associated with them. So it'll take some time to get it prepared to bring back. But we do have time to do this. Thank you, Brian. I just wanted to make sure I understood it correctly. I Since this is something that affects um, our school district in, in a long-term way for 10 years. I would really like all of our school board members and even our student advisor to weigh in and share their thoughts. So um, Director Kelly, do you mind? My thought would be similar to what I shared the last time as I preferred the option too, because I think it seems to um, be the, less, the least disruptive, if that's an okay term to use. And it has the smallest um, deviation, so I, I vote for number two. That's my one I'm leaning towards. Thank you, Director Kingman. Do you have any thoughts about redistricting? Yeah, I agree with Director Sherry in all accounts. Uh, map two is my option. Director Knapp, do you have any thoughts? I just have a question. I heard um, McKay mention the tribal lands for map option one, and I was wondering how those were affected in two and three? That's a, that's a great question. And I'm sorry, I did not address those. There's a, there's a small census block here that's um, a part of tribal lands and districts two and three um, were uh, kind of cutting right through there. And so in all options in the last, um, in the draft map um, hearing, we changed that so that those tribal lands are together um, in district uh, two. So in all three maps, they are together. Thank you. I figured I had missed that at some point along the way, but um, thank you for explaining that. So um, yeah, I'm with everyone else about option two. Thank you. And Kyle, if you had a, a vote, how would you vote? I have to agree with everybody else. The 0.3% on final option two just looks too good. So my option would be two. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so I would entertain a motion to select a redistricting map for our school board directors. 
Mary, can I have a question? I thought <clears throat> I thought that um, we were. I didn't know if we had to take action on this part or if the adoption of resolution twenty two oh six would be the map to because that's what it sounded like Brian was leading us into. Brian, can you go over that again? Because I I think it's two steps. First, we choose a map, and then the second step is adopting the resolution. But Brian, will you please weigh in? So adopting the res a resol the resolution that's presented today is in effect choosing map option two. So there's no action necessary on the first agenda item with uh, for redistricting. The action comes on the second agenda item with the adoption of the resolution. So we don't need to vote on it. We just need to vote on the, the next one where we adopt the resolution. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so then we can move to the next agenda item, the adoption of resolution 2206. Okay, if you could. Thank you, McKay. I'm gonna share my screen now with the resolution language. Thank you, McKay. And Brian, will you please share with us the resolution? Can you see it on your screen? We see it. Here's the resolution. There's quite a, a bit of uh, language uh, that constitutes the, the legal description for the boundaries uh, in District 1, District 2, 3, 4, 5. These reflect the boundaries that were shown on map option 2. And then the language of the resolution uh, describes the rationale why uh, the board is adopting a resolution modifying uh, the director districts uh, due to the census uh, being conducted in 2020 and, and how we got there, uh, what policy was followed, uh, the timeline for public hearings and publication of maps. So does anybody have any questions about the resolution 2206, the director district rejects redistricting say that 10 times fast then i i think we can um, move into our actions so do i have a motion to approve resolution 2206 director district redistricting i make a motion that we approve the adoption of resolution 2206 director district redistricting i'll second that it's been moved and seconded to Approve resolution 2206 director district redistricting. Madam Clerk, can we please take a vote on that mouthful? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you. The resolution is approved. And can I ask a personal favor about this lovely map that we like worked really hard on? When we present it on our website for the next 10 years, could it be just a little bit easier to figure out where you are on the map? Because when I was running for um, school board, um, I couldn't figure out where I lived on the map. And I know other people have also shared a little bit of concern and frustration on the map that was pre previously presented that we couldn't figure out where we were on the map. So somehow we need to be able to see the roads and highways and maybe even schools or something like that. So if, if that could landmarks, if we could possibly have a very clear map, it might help aid in the recruitment of the next people running for school board. Absolutely. And, and we, are, we already have one um, going forward, but if there are other things that you would like to see on there, I'm happy to um, modify that and make it more clear, but there are roads um, I think it's much clearer with the redistricting pieces. It's hard to, there's a lot going on. So it's, it, we don't want to confuse the public with, you know, it, it's cartography at its best. So, um, but yes, we do have roads on there. So, and I just wanted to say thank you very much and congratulations to you all for the next 10 years of, of director districts. 
Yay for director district redistricting being done. All right, next up is our adoption for resolution of 2208 rejecting bids and calls for new bids on Kent Prairie Elementary site access project. And this will be presented by Brian again, Brian. Thank you. Um, two weeks ago, uh, we opened bids for a project at Kent Prairie Elementary uh, for the addition of a queuing lane uh, adjacent to the school. Uh, and the day before we opened bids, we received a notification from the city of Arlington uh, that they would not approve our permit for construction with the inclusion of a pond for stormwater management as was uh, written in our plans. There were no city codes uh, requiring us to include the alternative, which was uh, underground, underground stormwater management. And uh, uh, the reason why the city uh, did not approve our permit was because of the proximity to the Arlington Airport. Uh, there is a requirement of the Federal Aviation Authority that uh, any kind that precludes construction of open surface water management structures as we had included uh, in our original plan uh, to uh, prevent the congregation of waterfowl uh, that could result in a bird strike on an aircraft. So we've got to rework our plan. Uh, we're in the process of that, but since we had already received bids, we received four bids and they were all very competitive and they were all really good. Uh, but we, uh, under the guidance of our uh, attorney uh, relative to construction matters, we need to reject those bids and accept new bids. So we're in the process of determining the timeline to do that right now uh, so that the, we can accomplish this project without disrupting the site uh, and, uh, and be within the weather window for which this kind of construction uh, needs to be accomplished. Uh, but at this point, we need to, uh, again, under the advice of our attorney, ask that you adopt a resolution rejecting the bids that we did receive and going up to bid again. Does anybody have any questions for Brian about this rejection? Brian, can you just give your, your best guess of the timeline of, of how this will move forward when we, um, if we adopt this resolution rejecting the bids and we call for new bids, what would the timeline be to accept a new bid? And because we don't have a board meeting until the middle of July, how does that, how's that going to work? That's when we would hope to bring you a new contract uh, at the next board meeting in July. Uh, and get the contractor working on the site. Uh, the site is um, distant enough from the school itself that the construction could be accomplished without disrupting uh, educational activities at the school if, if the job were not complete prior to the start of school. Uh, it's really the weather uh, is, you know, the, the primary consideration of course is, excuse me, Sorry about that, uh, is you know, making sure that we don't disrupt the educational program. But since it is outside uh, and that is a very wet site, uh, we need to make sure that this work will be substantially complete. With this. Brian, I have a quick question too. Is the is a new proposal still looking? Do you have a queue lane? Yes. The, the only difference will be that instead of having a pond, to collect storm water, we'll have to have uh, an underground concrete stu structure uh, to collect storm water before it enters the stormwater okay. management system. That sounds sounds like a, just a just a modification, then basically. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's substantial enough to merit um, going back to bid though, so that we we make sure that the cost is appropriately considered in the proposed contract. All right, any other questions for Brian? 
anything from our student advisor about stormwater, birds, and concrete. All right. Um, this is an action item. Do we have a motion to adopt resolution 2208 rejecting bids and calling for new bids? I make a motion we adopt the resolution 2208 rejecting bids and call for new bids for Kent Prairie Elementary Site Access Project. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2208 rejecting bids and call for new bids for Kent Prairie Elementary Site Access Project. Madam Clerk, can we please take a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you all. The a resolution 2208 is adopted. Um, next up, we have our second reading and adoption of board policy 2140 guidance and counseling. And this will be presented by Carrie Henderson Burke, our executive director of teaching and learning. Thank you so much. All right, this is our second read. So um, uh, quite a few changes really um, and updates to this policy, but um, all in line with legislation and an attempt to ensure that our counselors are focusing their efforts directly on kids and not paperwork. There's still paperwork, but trying to control that a bit better. Any questions for Carrie HB? We'll be bringing a plan forward to you before too long. But one of the things that's pointed out in this policy is that it's a living document. The plan will adapt, grow, and change. So we'll have a transition plan and the actual plan, um, and, and we will make modifications as needed on each of those. Thank you. I know the counselors have been working very They're hard. Very for excited the last few about years this. This has been something they've been waiting for. This is an action item. Do we have a motion from anyone to adopt this policy? Make a motion. We approve the board policy 2140 guidance and counseling. I second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt board policy 2140 guidance and counseling. Madam Clerk, can we take a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you, the policy is approved. And thank you to all of our school counselors for all that they do. Next up, we have our informational item. We'll start with our superintendent report, Dr. Sweeting. Just wanted to uh, say again, how excited I am for the new students to join us, the nine students uh, representatives. And I'm also excited for all the um, events this week, the retirement today, and then tomorrow, Weston's graduation, and then the eighth grade uh, celebrations on Wednesday, and then Arlington High School graduation. So just lots of good things happening. I also have a, uh, for each of the board members, it's a special fob that you put on your keychain, and they are identified specifically Yes, just specifically for you to this building, not to every building in the district, but to this building so that when this building is, you know, locked, you can come on in. And uh, yes, you can. You can just come right in the door. So I, and the, they're, they're uh, keyed, they're code to you. So if this is like you, Mary Levesque, that's you. It won't, you know. So that, and the reason why these are coded is that if you were to lose it, then we could decode it um, or anything like that, so. Well, that's an exciting thing. Sorry, Kyle. Next up, we'll have our legislative update. Um, Director Kelly, do you have anything to share with us? I do not have anything to share at this moment, but thank you for asking Mary. <laughs> Thank you. There will be much more, I'm sure, in the fall. Um, can we hear from our student advisors? Absolutely. I have a lot of talking points today. However, I will try to make it as short as I can. Uh, first off, I would just like to thank everybody, all nine students who will be joining us for the new advisor, uh, the new ACE committee members, and the equity team members. I'd just like to say thank you for your time for applying and congratulations. And we'd love to have you here and see what you contribute. Moving on from that, 
congratulations to all 34 of our retirees. It's been great having all of you. I got to have uh, at least a couple of the teachers, and I know a lot of them, and they're all amazing people. Um, also, uh, just a final goodbye to Mr. Fish. It's been amazing to have him here at the high school, and I know he left already, but just thank you to him as well. Uh, welcome to the new staff members as well. A lot of welcomes and goodbyes today. Um, also, we have the Weston and AHS graduations, and I'm lucky enough to be able to participate in both of those and just sit with the board, and I'm looking forward to that, especially because my brother is one of the people graduating. Um, I'm a bit more excited to be on the podium with him than he is, so. Um, but with that, I think that is everything I have, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Um, do any other board members want to share any comments? Um, I am just really happy to see all of the student involvement in all of our committees. It makes me just very happy to see um, the willingness and I appreciate the student voices on our board. Um, I know that not all boards have that and I just can't imagine being up here without student voices. And congratulations to all the graduates that we get to see this week. I'm really excited. Thank you. Director Kelly, do you have any comments? It's been a year and I'm looking forward to Friday. Um, hmm. Hmm. I'm glad one person. Thank you, Director Kelly. Um, Director Kingman, would you like to share any comments? Yeah, I'm just really looking forward to the two high school graduations uh, ceremonies this week, and I'll see you there. Thank you. I am very excited about wrapping up this school year with a pretty bow and celebrating all the good things that we've been able to accomplish this year. I want to remind the board to do their self-assessment. Um, I'm not sure if we've sent a link or anything recently, or we will, but sometime by the end of June, we're supposed to do some kind of board self-assessment from WASDA. It went out and I ignored it. Okay, maybe maybe we need a reminder a couple times, maybe like every day, I don't know. Um, but just wanted to remind everybody to do that and myself included. And to wrap up this board meeting and this school year, I wanted to share a little poem I wrote just for fun. 21-22 um, was quite a school year, back in person with challenges and cheer. Um, September began with our meetings on Zoom, then moving back to the BPAC and boardroom. Erica and Mike joined in December as we said our farewell to past board members. We grappled with masks and in-person meetings. We looked at metrics of health and evaluating seatings. We focused on student learning and the metrics concerning. We studied, connected, and built our new team we learned much as we met on a live stream. We welcomed and embraced challenges galore. This year was most definitely not a bore. With community collaboration and communication a go, we see change as a constant, even if slow. It's been quite a year and thank you all for being here. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I make oh, a motion. Oh. Wait, I forgot. This is the best part. We get to announce when our next meeting is, and it is not for a very long time. It is on Monday, July 11th at 6 o'clock p.m. right here in the boardroom. And um, so that means you have a long time to think of lots of good questions, Kyle. And, and then we can have now a motion to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Make a motion, we adjourn the meeting. I second. Thank you, can we have a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Kingman? Aye. President Levesque? Aye. Director Knapp? Aye. Thank you, this meeting is adjourned. We'll see you all on July 11th.